understand that there were six trips by the Secretary of State, so it's not just a case of suddenly the seas parted and there was uh, an epiphany. The fact is this reflected a lot of work by the Secretary with both leaders, uh, both Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Abbas. This is really a culmination of the Secretary of State working on this since the beginning of the administration. The economic dimension of this, I think, is not something to be sneezed at. What uh, Kerry and Blair uh, put forward at the Dead Sea, I think also their ability to get some of the Arab League countries to come around and to provide political cover for Abu Mazen, for President Abbas, is key. And let's put it in perspective. It is the beginning of talks. It's not the conclusion of talks, but it is the beginning of talks, and it's the beginning of talks with some understandings at least that give them each a reason to believe this is serious on the one hand uh, and they're each making a commitment to stay at the table on the other. When we talk about final status issues, ending this conflict, we usually come up with like four issues, which are borders, security, Jerusalem, and refugees. We're in the 20th year since the beginning of Oslo where there's an understanding that you address what are the core issues. Uh, it's not as if these issues have never been discussed. They obviously have been discussed, but not between these two leaders and not between their negotiators. There are a lot of modality questions which may sound boring, but they're important. What is the American role in the talks? Are the Americans in the room? They're out of the room. If I had to bet, I would say out of the room. At what point can they put forward their own proposals? How do the leaders engage in synchronized political messaging? This is not the era anymore of Menachem Begin, of Anwar Sadat, of Yitzhak Rabin, of these gigantic leaders who basically swept the publics with them. But rather, these are leaders that are always doing cost-benefit analysis. Is the public with them? They don't want to get too far out ahead. But can they bring these publics along? I think they're going to have to synchronize their efforts if, if they really want to bring the publics. But I think it's crucial because without the publics, I don't see these leaders like galloping forward. So I think they have to discuss things that are not just the four issues themselves, but how are they going to talk about issues? Why spend our time on this when you got Egypt, when you got Syria, when you got Iran? And part of the answer is because on Egypt and Syria, uh, our ability to affect those, even though our stakes are higher, our ability to affect those is somewhat limited. Moreover, those represent enormous upheaval with no clear outcome, but the one thing you know for sure is it's going to take a long time. Before anything begins to clarify, either with Syria or with Egypt, it's going to take a long time, and things could get much worse before they get better. So you've got all this upheaval out there, and right now between Israelis and Palestinians, you don't have peace, but you have a kind of stability. Do you want to have that issue collapse as well? I mean, do you want to see somehow another intifada erupt uh, with the Palestinians? So that in addition to all the other people, you also have a people here. One of the main reasons for doing this is precisely because this is right now stable and you don't want it to become unstable. But having this issue stabilized on a more uh, firm basis, on a more long-standing basis, is something that is profoundly in our interest. The paradox is on the one hand, you have a region that is just in turmoil and upheaval and you would think that would have a chilling effect on both sides. And the truth is up until now it has had a chilling effect. But the paradox is it also means that everybody else in the region is completely absorbed. And they're absorbed on themselves, they're not absorbed on this issue. So for each, for the Israelis and the Palestinians, while the environment creates an instinct to be cautious and in many ways to avoid big steps, that very same environment means that there's more political space for them to do it because everyone else is preoccupied and much less likely to react to what they do. I have to say that the prospects of success at this point are still long. I mean, it's not an accident that there isn't peace. There are real differences between these two sides. These are existential questions in the minds of both. Uh, it's not easy to get at them in a way that creates points of convergence. In the past, the, 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 the motto was, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. Is that still going to be the motto, or is it going to be if we, if we get an agreement, it's locked in? 
Um, now this might you know, sound esoteric to some people, but it's actually very important because it gets to the question of can you divide these four issues up. Uh, in the Middle East, I feel whenever it's all or nothing, it's always nothing. I mean, the key to any kind of negotiation is for each side in the end to believe that what matters to them is actually going to be satisfied. You don't have to be assured that there's a, that there's a, a certain outcome that satisfies you, but you have to have a sense that there's a possibility. The silver lining of low expectations is that Netanyahu has not had a problem domestically with his right wing because they, they're convinced the boss won't cut a deal. So they're giving Netanyahu more wiggle room on that side. Hamas doesn't like it that Abbas is going to the table either. But no one is really threatening these two gentlemen for having their people at the table. But still, you know, I think you have to say expectations are modest. So I think if they try to do it all, they may fail. But if they try to settle for less and don't overreach, they may achieve things. <music>